Hello, Facebook. Ooh. Hi, you guys. What up, Facebook? Hello. Hi. We are here. Give you guys just a little bit of time to come in and join us. Nope, we're getting right to the point. So the first poem. <laughs> <laughs> Hope everybody did their homework and read the uh, five poems we're going to be talking about tonight. Super excited to be joined by two of the poets of two of those five poems. Uh, Osa and Julia Rabia. So excited. Thank you, ladies, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. And um, before we start, I did just want to say um, an update on our GoFundMe. Um, last week, we had a 24-hour live stream, and it was super successful. We ended up meeting our goal um, by the end of that stream. Um, so thank you, everybody who came out and donated and joined the live stream. Uh, but we've decided as a board that um, we want to keep going. So any donations over our goal of $1,000, the board is going to match one-to-one -one up to $250. Um, so we kind of have a new goal of um, $1,250 now. Um, the link is in the ticker below. It'll be there the whole video. So if anybody is interested, anybody likes what we're doing, anybody wants to support us, uh, you can go to our GoFundMe. Um, even a donation of $5 goes a long way. Mm -hmm. And if that's not something you can do, if um, you're going through like financial hardships, as many of us are due to COVID, you can join our volunteer list by emailing info at Stand Up for Equity. Just include your um, contact information. As everything gets opened up and we all get vaccinated, we're going to start having live events, and we do definitely need volunteers to help out with that. And if you don't have the time to donate or the means to, or, sorry, the time to volunteer, the means to donate, uh, you can support us by just showing up to events like this, uh, participating. Um, we have our live chat going. So just show up, share our videos, like our posts, follow us on social media. Uh, you can see our show, social media tags in the ticket below as well. Like Sam said, $5 matters. At one point in time uh, for our 24 hour live stream, our goal was $1,000 and we sat at 900 uh, $95. So $5 really can literally make the difference. <laughs> You're on the fence about that. So, um, we have uh, an order that we wanted to get in on on these poems list. We kind of talked about it. Yeah, I think we want to start out with Among Women by Marie Ponset. <laughs> Yeah. Super excited about this one. This is one I picked. Um, I really like this one. Uh, <laughs> did you, do you want me to read it? Yeah, go for it. Okay. This is Among Women by Marie Ponson. <clears throat> what women wander? Not many, all, a few. Most would now and then, and no wonder. Some and I'm one, wandering, sitting still. My small grandmother bought from every peddler less for the ribbons and lace than for their scent. Of sleep where you will, walk out when you want, choose your bread and your company. She warned me, have nothing to lose. She looked fragile, but at high blood, runners could endure, endure. She loved her rooted garden, her grandchildren, her once wild, once young man. Women wonder as best they can. So I like that. It's um, I to me, it's about um, some of the limitations that society places on women. Um, it's all about raising a family. All about being, um, you know, obedient to men. Framing it in a, in a male centric way and then the poem is saying that every every woman takes their own path um to be free and independent and really you know forge her own personality you know her her grandmother um had the stereotypical you know the family and the, and the nice house and everything like that um but you know she bought all these ribbons and lace because of how they smelled. And I thought that was really cool because smell is like an underutilized uh, sense. 
and it's just really cool to be transported by a sim. <laughs> I just like that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I don't know. For me, it kind of speaks on lessons learned in womanhood. Um, as you like, this is his grandmother giving what to me seems to be his granddaughter advice about the mistakes that she made that you probably shouldn't make or that you could potentially learn from. And so I see it as when she says, have nothing to lose. It's, you know, it's like, don't put any, you know, too much stock in like men. Don't put too much stock in your marriage. Don't put too much stock in this one part of your identity because doing so means that you will literally lose everything if you lose one of those things. So it's almost about like women should, and I was telling someone this other night that women should literally not just be these central things like I'm a wife and I'm a mom, but it's okay to be the CEO. It's okay to be the organizer. It's okay to be the wife, the mother. It's okay to be all these other different identities. And that is what makes you you, but you're not just some man's wife and you're not just some child's mother. So having, you know, having more than just one identity is awesome. Hmm. Yeah, I what I really spoke to me about it is um I guess I was kind of reading it more from like a a wider sense of what the feminine can mean because we live in such a a society that that values, you know, order and linearity and um kind of these masculine qualities of like striving for an ideal and like having a vision and like um but here she she's talking about just wondering, you know, do we ever really give ourselves the freedom and the space to do that? You know, we're we're very goal oriented oftentimes, and I think that that does kind of come from this masculine, not male, because you know, everyone has this, but a masculine orientation toward life. And um, for me, like her talking about just. Um, being attracted to things because they smell of the wandering, because they smell of this freedom. And um, it's not something we're striving toward. It's just fluid. It's every moment. So um, there's like a spaciousness to that that I found to be really beautiful, like a breath of fresh air. So. Yeah, and I think I tend to, to agree with what Julie just said. And especially because at the beginning it says, like, what women wander, not many all a few so it sounds like like not many people do take that time to appreciate that freedom that comes from wandering it's very goal oriented and you know results driven um but taking that time to wander and to really explore what you want to uh, walk out when you want to choose your own bread and your own company and have that freedom i think it's a really powerful message in this poem but at the same time it says, you know, not many some all a few. it's everyone does to some extent in their own way. So there's some mm -hmm. people who are just so free and they wander all over the place. Some daydream, you know, it's whatever connection mm -hmm. you have to that idea of wandering. Yeah. And I like how at the end she kind of brings it back to the limitation that society places it on us because she says in the end, we do it as best we can. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's like, almost we have to like really carve out space for that because it's just so not valued, I would say, in our society. Um, yeah. I would say I love how the poem starts off, um, feels a little ungrounded, kind of like the wandering, mm -hmm. like, but in an ungrounded way. And then toward the end um, where she says she loved her rooted garden kind of brings like the imagery of the earth and how um, all this feminine energy is natural and um, we will endure, we will endure, could endure. I just love how it transforms so quickly. Yeah. Awesome. Well, anything else about this one before we move on? <laughs> Okay. What's the next one? Um, I think we're going to play a short video. Um, we're going to do 
Bitches by Melissa Lozada Olivia. Women in my are bitches, cranky bitches, stuck up bitches, customer service turned sour bitches. Can I help you, bitches? Next in line, bitches. I like this purse because it makes me look mean, bitches. Can you take a picture of my outfit full length? Get the heels in, bitches. I always wear heels to la fiesta. I never take them off, bitches. All men will kill you, bitches. All men will leave you anyway, bitches. You better text me when you get home, okay, bitches. Pray before the baby comes, bitches. Pray before the plane takes off, bitches. She has my eyes, my big mouth, and my fight, bitches. Sing to the scabs on her knees when she falls down, bitches. It's okay not to be liked, bitches. Give Agulita bendiciones, bitches. The vengeful violent, piss prisked and polished. Lipstick stained on an envelope. I'll be damned if I'm compliant, bitches. The what did you call us? What did you say to us? What's that kind of love called again? Bitches. Love that one. Yeah, I love that one too. <laughs> Which I, I think it was really interesting. I said this to everybody before the stream started, but um, I think this one parallels the first one we talked about a lot in the sense of like freedom and uh, using this word bitches, which has historically been used to put down women as like a freeing, empowering word um, about the women who aren't, aren't, you know, necessarily what society thinks of women as, um, but celebrating that. Yeah. I really love how she uses the repetition of it too. It's like, it's in your face again and again. Like, it's almost like at first you cringe the first two times and then you're like, okay, I guess we're just going to mm -hmm. keep saying bitches this entire time until <laughs> you get used to it, you yes. get comfortable with right. it. Yeah, it's like, you know. <laughs> Because I feel like with women, this is a phrase that amongst our inner circles, we use for every single thing. It's, you know, and it's, it doesn't even have that same connotation. And, but then when a man says it to us, it's like, you know, it's like you, mm -hmm. offended, you offended the goddess within me. Like now I must <laughs> kill you. <laughs> it's, like, you know, it's like, it's going to come in, you know, but it's like, this is like our... This in the word bitches in this way, the way she uses it, it means so many different things. It's it's love, it's anger, it's annoyance, it's um always kind of like my I guess like African American women, we have the way that we say girl. It's like girl, girl, girl. <laughs> we done said five hundred <laughs> different things in that, but it's one word. So it's like bitches for that is like you know, she's giving all this identity to this one word. It's all encompassing. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of yeah, interesting Shmika, for me. I agree. Yeah. It's kind of interesting <laughs> for me <laughs> watching this one. Excuse me. <laughs> uh, after uh, I just uh, maybe four days ago watched the episode on the word "bitch" from uh, that Netflix swear word show, it was kind of interesting to see the uh, the history on it and how it's basically been der derogatory for almost six hundred years, but only within the last 30 or so has it mm. had that uh, um, kind of been taken back as as to not mean specifically derogatory though it is but but can can have much more of a meaning to it and I, I like how she's able to play on that through this poem mm. hmm. yeah I really like when Just, um, oh Julie, Julie, don't bite all your head off. <laughs> no, Julia, you go for it. Okay. Um, yeah, Shamika, just dovetailing off of what you said, um, it's almost like the word, every time it's repeated, it's like gains power. You know, it's like an incantation or something. And by the time yeah. it's said at the end, it's like when she says, she says something about love. I don't remember what's what the exact line is. What's that love called again? What's that love called again? And then it's like, bitches, that is the love. That is mm -hmm. it, you know? And it's just, I just love how it builds to that point. It's like this all-encompassing word. And um, yeah, and it speaks to me as a woman just because of the socialization and the kind of domestication that we've grown up in to be nice or 
this kind of image of what the feminine is that's not really true, that's kind of like this oh, more receptive, more like inward, more uh, quiet and pure, or whatever the bullshit is. <laughs> the bullshit. And, um, <laughs> yeah. And just, I love this piece, just feels like a rushing stream that's been let out after like the dam broke, and it's just this roar. Um, which feels so satisfying to me as a woman. It's just like, oh, I can breathe again. So yeah, that's what I love about this. Yeah. Yeah. I just love the different, for me, it's to play on the different types of women that she's like, the women in my mm -hmm. family are bitches. And I'm like, oh, mine too. Um, <laughs> and they're all those different women. I, I have a cousin that always tells me, call me when you get home and let me know you made it in. And I never do, but she says, <laughs> she says it every time and I never do it, but she says it every time. So it's just, there's like all these different women in your family and then when she says that and goes into it, I'm like, damn, we must have the same family. So it's that and it's very cultural in that way. I love that familiarity across cultures. I'm not a Latino woman, but in that moment she makes she brings in my family to hers. And for one, you know, moment we're the same person, the same race, the same culture, same identity. So it's just like that's it's really bridging, bridging people, bridging women. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, I I also feel like I connect with this so much with like when she said, when she was like abuelita, like play your yeah. abuelita. Mm -hmm. I was like, ah, my abuelita. <laughs> 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 um, but also like another thing that stood out to me were the heels. Um, and also I think it's part of kind of the Latin culture too. Is I mean, the Latin culture is absolutely masculine, very masculine. Um, and I always heard when I was a kid, or like not a kid, but when I was younger, like, oh, you gotta wear your heels to like the pretty party or whatever. You have to like, you know, wear your heels so you can impress. And she kind of turns it around because she's like, well, I'm gonna wear my heels because I wanna look cute in the picture, not for you, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's what she's doing with the bitches too, which is awesome. I love it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Like, like Micah said, you know, for whatever, 600 years, it's been a super derogatory term. And I think she turns it around the hardest in a couple of spots where she talks about, like Shamika said, you better text me when you get home, bitches. You better, you know, pray before the baby comes, pray before the plane takes off. And it's like, it's infusing the word with a level of caring and love that, you know, the, the way it's been used for so long has been very antithetical to him. I mm. thought that was cool. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely strong reclaiming of the word. I was almost like that moment you're really proud to be a bitch. It's like, oh, oh yeah. It's so hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm proud of them. And like, it's just like, uh, it's like, it definitely, anyone that screams, I mean, I think as women, we've all had those moments where. We did step out of, you know, Julie, you've been talking a lot about femininity, where we step out of our femininity because the roles in our lives, I know I have a role in my everyday life that does not allow for femininity to really mm -hmm. exist. And mm. we have to play on more masculine features. And if someone, of course, because you are a woman stepping into a masculine role, you get called a bitch. And it's almost like, it's so damning and like, like in the moment. But this is like, you know, when you get called a bitch now and it's like, just be proud and stand there and be like, I mm -hmm. am that bitch. I really am. Thank you. <laughs> thank you I so am much. A bitch. Yes, <laughs> yes thank you, you are yes, accurate. I love that. Say, thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. And walk away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh -oh. Well, and then like Sam said, you know, with, um, tying it into Among Women, it's about breaking free of traditional, you know, gender roles um, with a couple of lines. I like, it's okay not to be liked. Mm, um, mm, it mm. was like, I, like, I better not be compliant or something like that. Oh, yeah. It's, it's turning the focus away from the historically looking at women through the male um, lens and really showing women speaking from themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think I say that so often. Like, it's okay not to be liked. 
Preach. Oh, no, that's a good I'm thing, like, actually. Sometimes <laughs> yeah. you just have to say that because just like, there's a part of you as a woman that wants everyone to mm-hmm. like you. I don't, you know, even mm-hmm. the way I think it goes yeah. back to the way we're socialized. And it's like, man, if I'm not the life of the party, if I'm not the girl that has 50 friends, if I'm mm-hmm. not, you know, if I can't fill up my entire bridesmaid crew from one wall to the next, and I'm not, I'm not popping, I'm not good enough, I'm not likable. And it's like you have to remind yourself man I, it's okay not to be like whatever is it you're yeah if you're doing you yeah <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's such a great piece Anything it is, else? It is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> all right sam what is next so next we're doing dear black girl by candace nicholas lipman okay yeah. Thanks to Shamika for picking some really great uh, form pieces. And we have mm-hmm. uh, representation. I just think it's so cool to see these pieces done, performed, um, so that you can not only, you know, the, there's power in the words, but there's so much more power in the world. Here's praying that YouTube lets it stay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so just so no one has to feel the pressure of going first. Me and my girls got you. Oh, yeah. Growing up as a kid, I hated my dark skin. And if I could be transparent, even now as a grown woman, I have to constantly reprogram my thinking, years of being told I was not the standard for beauty, but see, that was a lie. Which is why I chose to rewrite my own narrative. Dear black girl, we are warriors whose spirits can't be crushed. We speak up when told we're too much. We forgive when our black men dismiss, degrade, and can't see that we are not the ugly ducklings, but the swan princess, the Nubian goddess, the reflection of our ancestors, the maid in his image. When society tries to pin light versus dark skin, we remind them that every shade of chocolate is divinely crafted. Black girl magic is more than a hashtag. Yes. It is a movement, a statement like Maxine Waters claiming our power moving through this world unapologetically degree holding with our heads held high. Melanin, moisturized, big hips, thick thighs, hair, free and natural, wrapped in a protective style. Dear black girl, you better recognize we are the trailblazers. Everybody yeah. wants to be us. Come on, please, come on. So to all my sisters, as we continue this process of loving our skin, start with this. Look at yourself in the mirror. This is me, the chocolate beauty deserving and saying, I am queen, the dear black girl. No. That you, you are everything. That poem is a whole lot. <laughs> There's a lot there. It's a whole lot. Real quick, one of my favorite things about the poem was actually well, just the, the entire thing is a performance. The the actual what you call the poem is is smaller than the actual video. And so one of my favorite things about it is not of the poem. But it's when they get up and they go, we'll say, just, you know, in case nobody else wants to, we'll go first. We'll take care of it. And it's like, who wants to go second after that? That's <laughs> That's <laughs> true. You have no other favor here. <laughs> you should have saved that for last, whatever this was. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I like the emphasis. It's a lot going on in this poem because when she starts out saying I had to reimagine beauty for myself because of the world in which I live is does not reflect beauty through me. 
um, I think that's an experience of a lot of African American women who were once girls not seeing yourself reflected in society. I'm I'm thankful that that's changing for younger girls because you know we have so much more representation now. But like when we were like growing up in the '90s, it wasn't a whole lot to see. Um, so when she says I had to rewrite my narrative and tell my story because it wasn't one set out for me. So I think that that really speaks to the African women's experience, you know, well, in America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really important when she said she wishes she was transparent because, mm -hmm. you know, that's got the dual meaning. It's like lighter than you are yeah. or just invisible, period. Mm -hmm. but that I actually, thought, yeah, I noticed that too. Yeah. I, I mean, I just, well, I think about that too, is like, yeah, lighter than you are, but then also where people can see you. It's just like, like I'm transparent enough where you can see, you can see me. So it's like, that's, that's also the meeting as well. Yeah, I appreciated uh, Shamika's, uh, what she mentioned about rewrite my own narrative. Like I, I, I think anybody can get behind that kind of mentality of just like things aren't going the way I think they should be. Um, and I don't see anybody else who's changing it. So that's, that's me now I'm going to do this mm -hmm. and I'm taking charge of my mm -hmm. own self and my own life and all this. And I, I always appreciate that kind of, uh, of sentiment. Sure. Yeah. So I also, I love that it's, no, oh, no, I was okay. just going to say, I love that um, it's three Black women doing this together. And there's really a sense at the end of just this, uh, this sisterhood, this really powerful sisterhood. And um, the way they look at each other at the end, it's like they, you know, they really see each other. Um, and I think there's something about that, you know, she is re rewriting her own narrative, but she all, through the power of her sisters, you know, like it, it's... It shows yeah. the importance of having that community and support and really being seen. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like if the men, because she says in the beginning, she's like, even when our men deny us or tear away, mm -hmm. you know, uh, tear away from mm -hmm. us, um, when you say like they see the identity through self and through reflection, but through the reflection of your sisters, it really matters. And I think in that way, it's like black women using their own ideas of what it means to be a black woman to shape another woman. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's like turning into the, the inner circle again to find who you are. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot here to unpack. I think, I wish we could spend a whole <laughs> hour on this one alone. Yeah. It's That's like, fun. when she says like, black girl magic is more than just a hashtag, I like, go mm -hmm. free. <laughs> yeah. 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 If you mm -hmm. knew the things that we have to do to make things look easy. Boy. Just a couple of things I wanted to point out. Um, this one was one of my uh, more favorite pieces just because of the production of it. Like I said, you know, I really appreciate that we have some of these. There are performances. And so I wanted to touch on a couple of those aspects. Um, the first thing was, um, like I said in the beginning, they talked about, you know, we're going to go first. And so it's, it's, it's some sort of like dinner party that these guys, but it's not, you know, it's, it's maybe, you know, 20, 25 people. Um, but they pan out to the crowd at one point and there's pe people are recording it on their cell phone. It was the first time that they did that. And just the look on everyone's face is like just shocked, but like in the best way. It's like, we did not expect like this high level of, you know, of poetry to be, you know, just whipped out here. Like you know, it's, it's shocking in the best way. And then uh, the incorporation of stepping into it. Really, you know, you mentioned it was the three women up there, and that's you know that's how they all first came together was their you know dancing and stepping and doing all that stuff. I just thought that was so cool. Y'all, John just learned a new word tonight. I'm telling you how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> he says, "Oh yes, it's stepping. Yeah. Stepping was really that. used, and they were stepping." They're looking up a lot of YouTube videos. That's man. what, guys. That's what. It's okay. You know, it's it's you have to uh, seek out the cure for that though. You got to find the information. I think after this, I'm gonna share some videos with SUFE about stepping because they might not have seen it before. So it's really uh, grandiose. Oh, yeah. 
stuff. Yeah, I've seen, uh, it's I've seen it's stuff great 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 organizations. Yeah, yeah, I know that they can. It's very, um, it's, it's very high level. It's high level up there. Yeah. Yeah, when she says that, and I wanted to talk about this too, it's like, she's like, everybody wants to be us. I know that that's like a hard thing to swallow for other women because as a woman, you are proud of who you are and what you represent and what you've come you know, to be. Um, but I think that that really speaks to this general sense that one time black women were considered you know, ugly for having like big lips and dark skin and big boobs and big thighs and big booties and now everybody's going to the surgeon to go get that and so it's like mm -hmm. like when did, mm -hmm. i think you wake up as a black woman you go when did i start to become pretty like <laughs> why when did it, <laughs> when did you want this life like because uh we've been fighting mm -hmm. so long to like i remember as a kid wishing my lips weren't so big like you know, trying to like bring my lips into my face and I couldn't do it, of course. Mm. But you know, it was just like, uh, how do I make my nose smaller? And then now it's like, oh, uh, you know, all these features are more desired. People are like putting their lips through suction cups and like hurting themselves. <laughs> and it's like, when did this happen? And so it's just like those experiences are will, it's, it's like, you know, we are redefining beauty in this country to, you know, be all the things, not just Eurocentric, but, you know, Afrocentric, you know, based on Latin features. It's like now beauty is everything. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes. At the end there, Julie, you talked about the, the look between all three women. And I think mm -hmm. what Shamika just described was what's behind that look. Because it's so essential to so many Black girls growing up, it's such a shared experience. Like that that's exactly what was behind that. Like they can all, you know, relate to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I thought it was really cool. Um Maybe not really cool because of the context of what I'm about to say, but um, on Twitter today, Corey Bush had a tweet about the representat uh, representative from Georgia that was arrested um, knocking on the governor's door when he was signing a voter suppression bill. Um, and this woman was arrested for really no reason. And I don't even, I think they were Capitol Police and they may not even have the authority to arrest somebody. Um, it's something that I read. But Cori Bush had a tweet about um, moments in history where black women have kind of been the backbone of these civil rights movements. Um, and I just kept thinking about this the whole time I was listening to the poem is just about the experience which Shamika has told us some about of, of black women being the backbone of the black community, but also the treatment that black women get um, in the black community. Maybe Shamika, you could talk a little bit more about, about that. Yeah, I mean, she says and she hits on it at first. She's like, when our black men dismiss us and make us feel ugly, um, she's talking about that, like that not being selected in your own community. I know I talk a lot about colorism in our meetings. Sometimes y'all be just going on tangents and they just let me have my uh, moment. <laughs> and they be like, let it talk, Jesus, because <laughs> we ain't going to ever be able to end this meeting until she says it. Um, and so, like, you know, we talk a lot about colorism. We talk a lot about how in our culture being dark skinned even in people whose first identity and, and you know to their name is african american you know we are first african american second um but even then our identity of being darker skinned is considered like oh my god you're dark you know and it's like god forbid that black women be dark skinned is it's like well, you know even the the ability of whiteness to even come into our culture and to become more preferred to blackness in a black space is you know an issue that we deal with in our own culture which of course the selection of more lighter skinned women for partnerships and considered more worthy and considered you know more feminine you know darker skinned black women in our culture are considered masculine so when you talked earlier about wearing the heels in Latin culture, um, you know, Latino culture, because it's more about making yourself look more feminine. We struggle with that here. It's like, you know, in spaces where men exist, trying to make yourself look as feminine as possible because darker skinned women are considered, you know, to be, you know, associated with men, male identity. And that is such a weird thing to say about women. But I mean, so many research articles have been printed about how um, even outside of our culture, 
you know, white men and white, you know, women see us as uh, as feminine, not as feminine, but as masculine and associated with our black men. And so, like, of course, that seeps into our culture where our black men don't see us as feminine. So we have a lot of issues where we struggle with being selected, being taken as women. And so now, like, sometimes even when I know I have the ability to bite back, I sit back and I'm like, let me just hold my tongue because I'm about to, you know, reinforce a stereotype about myself and about my community <laughs> as women. But, man, I be really want to tear that ass up. Like, but, you know, oh, <laughs> you can't be. And it's like, I'll be sitting back like, mm, ooh, I got 25 different sentences ready to fire. Missiles are loaded. But it's like that thing <laughs> in the back of your head is like so I, I love that bitch's poem because she's like, you know, who gives a fuck? <laughs> you know? like, what are you gonna say? You know, yes. be, the, be you. Uh, but it's like the living in that world where you want to be, you know, it's important to, I know some people don't care, but for a lot of women, we do want to be feminine. We want, we like being feminine. We love you know, the stuff that comes with our identity. Um, but there are times where we have to be weary of our identity because someone's going to take it as a weapon against us um, and use it, you know, for their good and not for ours. And so it's, mm. it's always that thing that's in the back of your mind. It's like, uh, how do I make myself more feminine? You know, do I say respectfully after this tongue lashing? Okay, respectfully. I didn't, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> what do you do? So. That's some of the stuff we talk about here at SUFD because it's important that we talk about and engage all issues related to cultural diversity. It's not just about like, let's talk about this group over here, but what about intersectionality and sub identities within these groups? Um, and how are we representing those individuals? And do those people get to tell their stories? So I love this poem because it's talking about black women in the group of black people. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Shemeek. <laughs> so, I'm super excited to have these ladies with us here tonight because they authored two of the poems that we're going to be breaking down tonight. So, we are down to those two. Uh, Sam, which one are we doing first? Uh, Marcella, do you want to go first? Sure. Cool. All right. My poem is called La Latina. And here it goes. La Latina. You don't look Latina. Oh, <laughs> I didn't realize you were so familiar with my culture. Tell me what you know. Have you been to my land or any land below the border? Have you seen the flowers? Have you seen the beautiful array of skin colors, the fruit or the mountains? Have you felt the breeze of my ancestors' breath blow through generations? Have you heard our music or soaked in the warmth of our touch? Have you walked through the brilliant green jungles that carry the singing guacamaya birds? Dímelo. How can I look Latina to you when you don't even know what my people look like rooted to their soil? Thank you. <laughs> One of my favorite things about La Latina is just the vivid imagery that you paint. Mm. It's just, it's mm. a, I have no idea what, um, I'm definitely going to say this wrong, but the uh, guacamaya bird. Oh, that was right. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what that is, but I can hear it when, when you say that. So I can hear it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank I you. love John so much. <laughs> <laughs> I love this poem because it's like... Um, you could have went so many different ways with that when someone says, uh, oh, you don't look Latina, you know, and it's just like, I, I would have been like, oh, I don't, I don't look, <laughs> you know, ready <laughs> to go in, but the way that you come and approach it is like, you know, you tell me what it means to be Latina, you tell me what it means to, you know, it's like that approach to it and then being able to discuss your culture through your own eyes, it's like, that's really, that's powerful work. 
because like really do you get to like hear your own culture through your own eyes and stuff without someone giving their opinion to what they believe it is. So like in the imagery that comes with it just really paints for me a land that I've never been to before, but I really would like to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And I love how you engage, um, you know, this question is so like, or not the question, but the statement, if you don't look Latina, I mean, it's so like superficial, right? It's like, I mean, there's so many assumptions behind that of like what a Latina person is, right? And, but you take it into all of the five senses, right? It's like this person has not connected to this land in any way beyond this just like kind of intellectual like impression that's just come from, I don't know, what society has spat out <laughs> or whatever but um yeah. yeah i just love how you bring it into like the sensual of of that land um and really bring it yeah to the it's like that living embodiment of what it what it is for you it's really comes across so yeah i love that you use that word yeah. sensual because it becomes very personal like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. be, you know, it just takes you there and it's just you feel like it's just the poem whether you know marcella was reading it so it was marcella and us we were right there but it, and it was just us and the poem mm -hmm. oh, cool. it's uh intimate yeah I kind of feel like the same way with um, the My Bitches poem. I definitely relate to this as well. I think you guys bring me into the Latin culture. It's like, I mean, I'm being taken into it and I feel like it's mine for a little bit, you know, even though mm. I, I'm not your people. Um, <laughs> I get to feel like that for a little bit, just being able to relate in so many different ways to even the term that you use. Have you seen, have you, have you seen my people? That's like a, it's a common term that's used in our own culture. We're like, oh, my people, my black people. It's just like, it's so, it's so cultural. It's so earthy. It's like the people that belong to the land, you know, like, you know, have you been to my land? Do you know what it means to really be from, you no, know, not this American thing that you created for like Latino culture, but like the actual place where we birth people who look like this, you know, they from, they, we're indigenous to this land, you know, that is like what it gives me. It gives me a home feeling of, yeah, that's, that's true, authentic, life you know not something we manufactured out of struggle or a fight to to exist but with people living free on free land i know yeah and i really love I, how you I do oh sorry oh, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> um, i was just gonna say i do think that um our cultures shamika um have a lot in common i mean like yeah. you're saying like the earthy the earthy mm -hmm. part the the familiar part like the family um, our families are really close. Um, yeah, I've like, been telling them that, girl. You should come in. Our <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then um, like the prayer from the bitches. Yeah, poem. like I pray to my grandma, abuelita. I pray to yeah. like whatever. It's, I feel like it's so similar yeah. in so many ways. Yeah, I always um, talk about the similarity between African American and Latino culture because I was just explaining to them like how family is so organized different between our cultures versus white culture. And I was like, yes. I dropped uh, fam familicio on them and I was like, you ain't heard that term, but it's like the bridging of extended family to the point there's like no difference between your grandma and your mama, you know, it's like there's no difference <laughs> between your brother and your cousin, you know, so it's yeah. that, that closeness, it's like, it takes me back to like, man, I want to go hug my grandma, I want to go hug my cousin, I want to go eat the food, you know, I just want to leave and go be with my family, that's what it brings to me. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> I, was gonna say, I, I really love how you take this like statement, you don't look Latina, which is like a really offensive thing for someone to say. Yes. And then you take that and you turn this into like a celebration of your culture. And it really feels like a celebration. Like you're looking back and mm -hmm. you're really proud of where you came from and, and your, where your roots are. And I think that's just like a really awesome thing that you did. Thank you. Yeah, I, I did hear, hear like, you don't look Latina. I still hear it a lot from people, but a lot less like when I was in high school or something. I'd hear it all the time. And it's also like a feminine thing. Like, I don't know. Um, 
there's like a stigma on like, oh, Latinas should have like long hair and like big boobs and a big butt, like same thing. Um, and it's like that, it's like, you don't look Latina. It's like, okay, well. <laughs> I get that. Like I definitely. Yeah. Yes, I get you. I think that I think about that all the time. Mm -hmm. Just like and not being when I was younger, I couldn't measure up to the way my mom and my aunt looked. Because I mean, my mom and aunt are like back in the day it was stacked up nice, you know. <laughs> and I was like, man, where's my big butt gonna come in? And when is my big boobs coming? <laughs> Amazon wasn't here yet, so, like, so and this is like, when is I'm gonna get? When is it gonna be me? You know, and then not feeling like you fit in because you don't look like that yet. So, or you might not ever look like that. So, people's ideas of what your culture is reflects back on you and makes you feel lesser. Yeah. So, uh, Marcella, if people want to get more of your work. Uh, where can I do that? At? Give some information. Yeah. Um, so currently, um, I'm getting published. I'm getting a book published. Um, it's called okay. Cilantro y Café, <laughs> um, which means obviously cilantro and cafe, uh, coffee. Um, and it's published by All Book Books. I have a website. Um, it's marcellaosa.com. So just like my name is printed on there. Dot com. Um, you can pre-order it. It's going to be coming out uh, like second or third week of April. And it's pretty much just like this is from the book. Um, it's pretty much about being a Latin woman. Um, and also like some stuff about depression and other things. But it is mostly about like my culture, my family, um, the food. <laughs> I don't know, um, but yeah, it's pretty short, but uh, fifteen dollars and website marcelosa.com. And so we also shared indoor skydiving. Is that is that in the uh, the collection also? It is. Yeah. Yes. So everybody, be sure that you go through at least scroll through and read those two poems, and then you will also decide that fifteen dollars is super reasonable for a collection of of those kind of poems. Um, Go check out the website and, and definitely order that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Preston. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So next we've got Julia. She's going to read us a poem also. Okay. This is This Wild Heart. This wild heart is your wild heart. Lady lover loving me, lost in a lusty sea. Perhaps I'm being too obvious by imagining you as queer, but isn't queer the godliest God can be? Beyond all binaries, defying duality, transcending pronouns of patriarchy. Still, I prefer to call you she. You created me to love the she's of all varieties, even in my musical taste, how I turn on mm -hmm. around like-minded ladies, our banter flowing like a river unruly, flirtation fluttering effortlessly. All those dudes caught in the trap of the stern-faced, rigid past. I used to be angry at their ignorance, but I realized their jealousy at last. Who wouldn't want to both be a woman and to make love to a woman, you see? Too bad for them, it could not be. And to the women who held us back, I pity you in all your fears for blindly following for thousands of years a worn, oppressive track. What a privilege the great spirit goddess gave me when she made me. What a privilege to love her and be loved by her through her own body. This wild heart is her wild heart. My offering to my beloved so that all can see God is whatever and whomever we love. And in knowing this, we are set free. Uh -huh. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that was so good. <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> really like um, in this one and um, what was the name of the other one that we shared? I don't have that pulled up. Uh, that was from the Ashes of Pain's Flame. Yes. Yes. Both of your poems that we shared are just so cool and immersive, mm -hmm. and they become like their own things that you they're like the like their own worlds that you build and then take us to. <laughs> they're grand ideas. They're the language that you use is just so. I don't, it's not over the top, but it's like. It's all its own thing. Is really like the only thing that I can say. It, it's just so cool. Well, that's I think we the spend, highest compliment I can expect. <laughs> <laughs> I think we were we were spending like I think an hour just arguing over our favorite ones of you. <laughs> we were just like, arguing and it's like no no I like this one but no I like this one better and I was like oh hell and we were all mad that our favorites didn't win. I got second. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that's like the best news ever for me. Thank you. It was so much. It's, I really appreciate the. Uh, I think uh, the linking the feminine worlds in our earth, you know, together, like putting. I think there was a poem that you put like the st the sun and the moon together, and it was just like, uh, I was just like, I love that the use of earth and the things that embody us around us as being these relationship ties that pull us in and pull us out, and being able to see our own intricacies intricacies of humanity in the world around us. That's what I love, mm. you know, most about the work that you're doing. So we argue, oh, child. We you. was in here going back and forth. <laughs> I love it. Good. That's what I want. <laughs> um, I loved all of it, but I, I would like. Okay, the alliteration was amazing. Um, lost in a lusty sea. Yes. It felt like I was like <laughs> in the sea, you know, like lost. In a, I don't know. Um, thank you. And then a lot of mention of goddess, um, kind of like the divine, women being divine. Um, I was talking to my friend the other day about how women were actually the divine before there was some switch. And then religion, like, it was like, okay, God is a man. Every God is a man. <laughs> Past 10,000 um, years, before, before that, before 10,000 years ago, God was a woman and all, I mean, the matriarchal societies that came before the patriarchy of 10,000 years, it was all about the goddess. So, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I love how you put that in there. Um, yeah. So beautiful. Yeah. It's just so interesting, like as a concept, you know, the, the gender of God, really. And it's, it's interesting, you know, in, in the Abrahamic religion, like God is sort of seen as like a vengeful sort of you know, keeping, you know, people, you know, with the rules and an authoritarian. In line. Yeah. And so in that way, like, I could see how it would be a man, but I would so much rather be a woman and just be, like, caring and loving and, and all of those things that you described the goddess to be in this poem. It's, if, if I could pick, that's, I would pick that. <laughs> well, there's also a wrath to the goddess, but it's different. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, I've actually, this was a huge thing for me. Um, inspiration for this poem was dealing with, um, so I come from the, the Sufi, the universalist Sufi tradition, which is a very, it's a very open kind of spiritual circle in the sense that we, you know, believe there's truth in all religions and like, you know, basically everyone's welcome and, you know, uh, your religion is your own, your relationship to the divine is your own. But, you know, that's based in, a history of a patriarchal religion. So there's been some elements that I'd really been struggling with. Like I've been so frustrated with seeing like God referred to as he over and over and over again. And it's not even like, like I think that the divine has a gender. It's just when you're constantly bombarded with that, it, you start to feel like you don't even really belong in this universe because you're not, that doesn't align. God that doesn't feel right. Image. Exactly, exactly. So, and another aspect of it that I've been struggling with is, you know, I identify as a woman loving woman. I don't know if I really identify with the word lesbian, but queer. Yeah. So, um, and in the Sufi tradition, we talk about um, 
God is the beloved and it's this, it's like this intimate relationship. And like, we, we all are God. We all are in this like sea of the divine, but like as a queer woman, I just couldn't relate, you know, this idea of like a male, like my beloved is the feminine. I'm obsessed with the feminine. <laughs> so um, this was kind of my, it was kind of a survival poem for me in a way of feeling like I'm allowed to, to be here as I am. So, mm -hmm. yeah, anyway. There's a part that you mentioned, you say, into the women who you say, like, don't understand or don't get it, like, who are wearing oppression and embodying oppression mm -hmm. and embodying the patriarchy against, you know, yes. women. I thought I related so much to that. It was like, man, I just say, I cannot stand when women go against their own good. You know, it's just like this good that exists for you and is ready for you and is accepting of you and you still fight it every day. Like, why are you fighting what is you? You know, come to the circle, gather, hold our hands as we surround this fire. You know, it's just like yes. stop being stop being against yourself. Like let your own spirit roam. Come through. This is who you are. It's made for you. I get that. And mm -hmm. I, the frustration that I felt when you were speaking that it was just like, yes, women just mm -hmm. fighting against what's good for them. I cannot handle it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um another thing that I really loved um was the the like all the talk about um sexuality or like sexual orientation and because I feel like even in LGBTQ plus community the gay man is more acceptable <laughs> like you yeah, right um and then the queer woman or the queer man queer woman and of course all the array of genders or non-genders um but I feel like as a woman that is queer like you don't feel as accepted even in that community. And I love the, I wanna read, I like wanna hear it again. <laughs> it was, it was good. Well, I think that that's really cool that you brought that out because I sometimes think with women who do identify with either gay or queer, they're taking less seriously when it concerns their sexuality, almost as if like, oh, you're just missing some good man that's going to come and make you feel good. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, no, 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 there's not a man that can make me feel good. <laughs> and, it's, <laughs> and it's like someone's going to, some man's going to come along like, nah, you're great, you know. But for men who identify as queer or, you know, bisexual or gay, like that's a static thing for them. No one questions that, that there's some good woman out there for them. Um, yeah. And on the same note, I, I think this is the first time I've ever heard God referred to as queer, which I absolutely love. Um, because in, in, the, in the Christian faith, which is what I grew up in, you know, you're told you're made in God's image, but you're not, that's not a representation, you know, if you're a woman or if you're queer. Um, mm -hmm. But thinking of God as, as this, you know, all, all knowing, all powerful being that made us in his image and understanding, or her image, and understanding that um, he is beyond the binaries, that are you know man-made yes. and social construction mm, right. is just right. like such a, a powerful concept that I yeah think that's and that's yeah. yeah i think that's the beauty of what the queer community is re revealing to us in this moment is like we're finally at a stage kind of in human evolution where we can see like oh it's not black and white it's not like there's so much gray there's so much yeah there's an array there's a whole rainbow yeah, yeah. One of my favorite things about just <clears throat> having this organization, having um, the platform to have things like this where we explore so much different is just having the ability to be exposed to all of these other different ways of thinking. It's so cool because, um, you know, everyone's touched on it. You know, what, what God's image and Sam said, you know, that, that Christianity says we're made in God's image. Well, as a white man, I just always took that for granted. Oh, we just look people so it's like god is a person he's not like a floating like orb of light he's like he's got arms and legs and stuff and it's like i think we all gonna be shocked when we get to heaven and i ain't even <laughs> <laughs> we're all gonna be like jesus that's you <laughs> 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 the privilege, don't ever stop to think about how other people interpret 
even you know something as large as what God looks like, or or small as you know it's something really small. And I just think that it's super cool to to have all these different ideas and representations, and just just to mm -hmm. be exposed. And, and I think that everyone you know can benefit just from listening to other people's you know ideas. Mm -hmm. hmm. Which I think is so crazy as you say, like I grew up thinking for you it's like, oh, God is a white man. And I was like, I never saw God as a white no, man. No, <laughs> I didn't say that was a white man. I was like, yeah, like, but he's in your own identity. And I was thinking like right. that's because that, he's relatable yeah. to you. And it's like when I first heard that somebody say, you know, God is a black woman, I was like, that is sounds so right to me in my head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it just fits. I'm like, yes, I can. Sounds right that. to me too. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds just right <laughs> to me. It's like I can see that. I see that now. I get it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's crazy to see <laughs> what what religion has organized religion has done with the image of like God in Christ. Mm -hmm. And blue -eyed, even though they have blue eyed and blonde hair, you walk into any church in America, mm -hmm. and and if there's mm -hmm. a like a statue of Christ on a cross, he's going to be white. He's going to be a white man. Mm -hmm. um, and just as growing up as a white man and being a white man, it's just so easy to like not understand that how harmful it is in people's minds when they say, you know, God, you're made in God's image, but you look up and you see Jesus Christ, who's a representation of God being a white mm -hmm. man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is really explorative, very explorative. <laughs> Like, we've gone to a whole lot of different places tonight, y'all. will follow yeah. a whole lot of different places tonight. I think I really love doing this. Um, I'm glad that we chose. I mean, even poetry to me is like, and I don't mean to degrade male poets, but it even feels like a feminine art form to me because it's like allows for that spiritual connection, that emotional connection, something that we've already associated with femininity and that masculinity just doesn't take in for itself. Uh, so it was, I'm so glad we chose this as a medium for Women's History Month to explore femininity, to explore women's struggles, to explore you know female identity, all of those things that we sometimes just don't get the chance to slow down and think about. And I'm so glad that there's like women in this room because usually it's a bunch of men and me. Yeah, and you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm hugging you guys too. <laughs> <laughs> so I am so glad that you guys came in tonight and brought your pieces because that was really groundbreaking stuff. Yeah, and so Julia, before before we wrap up, Julia, do you have any that you want to say about your work? I know oh, you have a book that's in the works yeah. as well. I do. So my book is still a TBD release date, but I'm working with my editor right now. We're about two thirds of the way through the manuscript. Um, so, but you can follow me on Instagram. It's just Julia underscore Rabia, like it shows in the picture. Um, and my website, JuliaRom.com, Julia, R-A-H-M.com. Um, also, as a part of the Valkyrie Ensemble, we're going to be doing this really awesome Earth Day show on uh, April 22nd. And it's all about kind of the divine feminine connecting to um, the journey of humanity and our relationship to the Earth and kind of leading to the ecological crisis and hope for the future. And it's going to be like very dramatic and have lots of beautiful music and a new commissioned piece by a wonderful female composer. So we're really looking forward to that if you're interested. Wow. The Gaia Gala, it's called. The Gaia Gala, that's so cool. Um, yeah, we're gonna be sharing some uh, Valkyrie stuff uh, to our social medias, guys, so you can keep an eye out there. Or uh, Valkyrie has all their own social media if you wanna play that as well. I don't want this night to end. Right? Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> it was so fun. Let's go through some yeah. more poems. Yeah, if you get, if, uh, <laughs> everybody watching this really enjoyed the conversations that we have. Don't uh, be afraid to like, comment, share. Um, get other people involved in this. And if we get enough, you know, interactions, we'll have you know part two. Hey, I'm here. For I that. know all of us really enjoyed breaking down these poems and things like that. Um, so if you guys enjoyed it as much as we did, show up. So I think that's going to be it for us, guys. Um, on Tuesday, we are going to have uh, our Tough Conversation series on hypermasculinity. Um, 
and that's really um, important to me personally. Um, you know, we're gonna, it's gonna be, you know, a closed session thing uh, for men to come in and um, talk with a licensed counselor um, on some of the issues that we have uh, with masculinity. Um, and it's going to be sort of through the female things that, you know, we might not even know that we're doing as men um, to, you know, talk about those things and address some of those things be better for all of the women in our lives. So if you uh, are interested in that, if you know somebody who might possibly benefit from that, um, you know, you can shoot us a direct message uh, on the Sooth page um, it's gonna be next Tuesday. So. Uh, we're also going to have a lot of resources if um, you know somebody's in there and they want to continue uh, talking to somebody about some of those issues. So, mm -hmm. super important stuff that we're doing, uh, and we're going to continue that tough conversation series in the future as well. So, I think that's all we got going on. Like Sam said, you know, keep donating to the GoFundMe. We're trying to get to twelve fifty. Uh, we're uh, matching one to one, everything up to the next two hundred fifty dollars. Uh, yeah. So. Make me reach into my pocket. Like I don't want to. <laughs> Make me do Make and me do uh, since it's our, our last public event before April, I do want to just mention the first event we have for April. Um, we are partnering with the Compass Health Network and Candace Graves um, to do a presentation on substance use disorder and yeah. its effect in the minority communities. April is Substance Abuse Awareness Month. Um, so we're going to hit that along with other topics about prison reform. Um, but that's our first event on the 6th at 7 p.m. Uh, well, thank you so much for staying with us. Thank you, Marcelo and Julie, for joining us. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Part of the yes. process. <laughs> Have a good night, guys. <laughs>